Any nation is defined by its propaganda. Propaganda is that thing which unites us. My father was arrested by the KGB. How does Russian propaganda work? You say one thing, you mean another thing. When Putin tells the whole world that there are no Russian soldiers in Crimea, we know that this is a lie, but this is what our audience wants. We've got to give it to them. How do we counter actual farms? The problem is not one person saying a lie. The problem is thousands or hundreds of thousands of fake accounts saying it. Sometimes America will be a great partner. Sometimes America will be the worst partner. There are some places where Ukraine can start a new communication. The West usually ignores the collective responsibility. We're trying to shorten the distance between truth and justice. Russian propagandists, can we bring them to trial? Nasastavilya is the main most successful propaganda line. Ukraine has completely rewritten the rulebook, is now a model for, for other democracies. Hi everyone, my name is Julia Tymoshenko and you're watching Ukrainer in English and a series in which we talk to different journalists, academics, experts from different fields and countries on uh, their perspective on Ukraine, the Russian invasion and its global impact. And today you have a chance to look at the perspective of Peter Pomerantsev, um, a British academic, a senior fellow at John Hopkins University and an author of two books about disinformation and propaganda, Nothing is True and Everything is Possible and This is Not Propaganda. Peter, thank you so much for being with us today. My pleasure. Uh, we're recording this interview in Kiev today and you were born in Kiev. Mm. Can you give a little bit more um, of your biographical background for those who may be not familiar with it? Well, it's all in my second book, This Is Not Propaganda, which, which is a, a mix of memoir and uh, propaganda storytelling. Um, but yeah, I was born here. My parents are, are from here. Um, but my father was arrested by the KGB in 77, 78, um, the year I was born. And, and like many sort of dissidents of that era, he was exiled from the former Soviet Union. Um, so really, I only had time to throw up over the USSR. And my parents left when I was nine months old. So I grew up, they ended up in England after many adventures, and I grew up in England. Um, so I only really knew about Kiev as this place in my passport. And I think the first time I visited here, I must have been 18 or something, something like that. Um, so it was sort of a mythical place for me growing up. Uh, my mother especially was obsessed with finding somewhere in Western Europe that looks like Kiev. So we lived in Munich, we lived in London. She was always going, I want to live somewhere that looks like Kiev. And so, uh, and she found places like that in different cities. Um, uh, yeah, so, so it was a bit of a revelation when I came here and realized, oh, that's what my mother was talking about. And how did your um, identity, I think, like because as you said, you left from here when you were nine months old, but then um, it feels like your um, identity of being from here really shaped your academic and uh, writer's career as well. Oh, that's a great question. How does it shape my identity? So I, I write about propaganda, but, but I don't write about it like a political scientist or even like a media and communications expert. Um, I'm interested in propaganda and the way it relates to identity. Um, I think the essence of powerful propaganda, often malign propaganda, is shaping uh, models of identity that are malign and harmful um, and rescuing people from their sense that they're unsure about their identity. That's what it plays on. So growing up um, as an emigre, growing up constantly moving between countries and cultures, I think I, I lived in sort of six or seven different cities by the time I was a teenager, made me very aware how um, identities are molded and changed by different cultures and by propaganda in, in the wider sense of the word. So, so that I think made me very attuned to this idea that the people are very much under the influence of, of what some academics call sociological propaganda, movies, culture, language, stereotypes, um, and that we adapt and change them. And that made me ask a lot of questions about freedom. When are you really yourself? When are you uh, under the influence of others? Um, so I, I think that sort of emigre childhood made me think 
a lot about these things because it was so noticeable. And I saw it on myself. Every time I moved a country, I would change. Every time I learned a language, I would change. Every time I moved cities, I would change. And that made me think, well, who am I then? I suppose, you know, so, so I was fascinated by those things anyway. Um, and, and then there was just the, 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 the problematic case of Russian propaganda and its influence on Ukraine, which has been going for centuries, but really became very active since 2004. So as someone who was really thinking about propaganda and the way that then gets weaponized and those needs and vulnerabilities get weaponized, um, I started looking at, at the case of Russian influence in Ukraine relatively early. Not that early, but, but relatively early. Um, but, but I think just, just that really. Um, I, I don't know. I've never thought about it deeper than that. I like being here. Um, my friends and family are here. Um, but I've, n I've never really directly thought like Ukraine propaganda. My interest in propaganda is, is part of my sort of international life. I mean, I, I do a lot of work in America now, in Germany, in, in Sweden. So I haven't actually been purely fixated on Ukraine. And since we already started talking about uh, propaganda, mm -hmm. and it's such a loaded term, mm. could you try to define that mm. for those who maybe have, I mean, there's various definitions, uh, I'm sure, but some people think that it's like purely this like horrible negative thing. Other people say like, no, it's kind of like everything is propaganda. So like, what is not propaganda? Like, how do you explain that? So yeah, so, so in my last book, This Is Not Propaganda, I specifically don't use the word. Um, apart from the title, simply because it's so loaded and everyone has their own interpretation and academics can't agree what it means. There's you know, many, many definitions of it. In the new book that I've just finished, I actually literally finished it on Friday doing footnotes. Um, there I explore the term a lot. Um, it's sort of unavoidable. It's a history book. It's about the Second World War and they're all the characters are using it all the time. So, I mean, the main thing is just define the way you're using it at any time. But you're quite right. Some people will say it's just any type of mass persuasion, which is done in the interests of those doing the persuading. Yeah. So there's some people would say there's no morality to that. If, if, it's, if, if the message or the cause is moral, then it's moral. If the cause is immoral, then it's immoral. But there's no a priori morality in it. Many others would say that it always involves some sort of manipulation of the other people where the audience don't quite understand what's going on. So in that sense, there's an inequality in the relationship um, and therefore it's somehow deceptive, which is the way it's usually used, yeah? So, you know, the classic case that's used in America is um, around environments. You know, there was a, a very famous bill by the Republican Party called the Clean Air Bill or something. And it was actually a way to allow for uh, more pollution. So that's a classic case. I mean, you say one thing, you mean another thing. So, so that's how it's usually used. Um, the sort of deeper way of looking at it, which is the way that a philosopher called Jack Ellul uses it. By the way, I don't know if anything of this is interesting, so you'll probably cut this out. So it's very interesting. But, so um, Philosopher called Jacques Ellul uses it, who's probably the most interesting philosopher on this question. He talks about different layers of propaganda. He talks about political propaganda, which is campaigns, PR, that kind of superficial thing that we often discuss, whether positive or negative. But then he talks about what he calls sociological propaganda, which is sort of the deeper myths and stories that we need to survive as a society. So if we're talking about America, things like, you know, the American dream, the American way of life, these sort of big ideas without which a society, a modern technological society, can't really survive. Yeah? His argument is that when we move from kind of little rural societies to big urban societies where, where people don't really know each other, people become united by technology, by mass media, and in order to survive as a community, propaganda is that thing which unites us. Any nation is defined by its propaganda. He'd still say that it can be a very negative thing because his idea is that these myths become, these myths become sort of subconscious. So we're not analyzing them. Yeah? So going back to something like the American dream, there's nothing wrong with the American dream 
as long as it's an idea that you can criticize and engage with. His sense was that with sociological propaganda, it becomes a myth and sort of people just live in it. And because they're just living in it and not analyzing it, they become very possessive of it. They become very aggressive to anyone they fear is threatening it. And they sort of cling on to it. And it leads to very, very undemocratic attitudes. So anybody who's not following the American way of life suddenly becomes an enemy. So that's a much more sophisticated way of doing it. Um, again, he would say that propaganda is inevitable. Propaganda is the way that we unite as community, communities in an age of technology. You know, that's a much deeper way of looking at it. I think the whole issue set gets more and more interesting as you move away from the supply side of propaganda, the creation of bots and trolls and messages, to the demand side, which is why do people want all of those things? Why do they want the disinformation? Why do they want the persuasion? How do they react to it? And, and why do they need the deeper sense of, of community and worldview? So it's very interesting because it almost like makes people not just like the objects to what like it, the propaganda throws on, but they almost like agents in it because you say that they want, uh, they actually need that for their social life. Listen, even on the level of the most banal political propaganda, which is what usually people focus on, the sort of like, you know, the campaigns that we all see and analyze and react to, um, the success of any propagandist in the sense of a, a spin doctor, a PR person, a political campaigner, is basically to understand their audience and to make their message fit the audience. That's, that is success. And the better you are at that, the more successful you are. And the worse you are at that, the less successful you are. So that is the num when you look at it from the point of view of the propagandist, that is the main question they're asking themselves. When they get up in the morning, their question is, how do I understand the audience better than my rival? And how do I reach them better than my rival? It is a nonstop activity in audience analysis. And, and the reason journalism in its classic sense pretty much always loses to any type of campaign, whether it's advertising, positive, negative, disinformation, information, is because journalism often doesn't think about its audience in the deep way that they do. And as long as we keep on doing that, we'll keep on losing. Now, there's lots of the question of what is a journalist? I mean, there's lots of media who are doing propaganda. So Fox News in America, it's only concerned with understanding its audience and giving them the information or the disinformation they want. There was just a case in America where uh, Fox News knew perfectly well that they were giving lies, saying that the last election was stolen. And there's emails between them going, we know that this is a lies, but this is what our audience wants. We've got to give it to them. But I mean, Fox News aren't really a media in any serious philosophical sense of the word. Um, so they're thinking like propagandists. And they got in trouble because officially they're media. So they had to pay a billion dollars in fines for this, $780 million in fines. All of this is a race to understand people better, understand their needs, their desires, their fears, their resentments. And that's the whole game. I want to go back a little bit as well to your specific focus on Russia and Russian propaganda, because it sounds like it's almost like there is no such difference between social and political propaganda. It's almost like all in ones because it's so uh, intrinsic in that society. Uh, how does Russian propaganda work both for the Russian audience inside, but also in the world as a whole. Uh, what, what do you mean by how does it work? Like what's what's the main kind of, maybe tools that it employs? Maybe what are the main insecurities if it's like domestic audience or uh, the foreign audience that it abuses in a way mm -hmm. to uh, send a message that either the government uh, or the, what we call like a propaganda machine, because very often we say like a Russian propaganda machine, but uh, is it actually a machine? Are there different actors? Is like the society also partaking in that process? So in, in the Soviet tradition and in the Russian tradition, which is an inheritor of it, propaganda is taken very seriously. Propaganda is led from the highest levels of political power. And while there are many acts involved, it is centrally coordinated and centrally managed. 
and it is taken very, very seriously. Um, the propagandist has always had a very privileged role in the political system from Lenin onwards. You know, they have this exalted role, which they don't really have in Western governments. In America, there is no propaganda tsar. There is no sort of information tsar. It just doesn't exist. Um, there's um, a small department in, in the State Department that thinks about global engagement with a, with a, a very limited budget and very little power. So the Russians take it seriously firstly, and it goes right to the top. It's, it's you know, controlled from, from the presidential administration. Um, there's a little bit of a division of powers between internal, external, between television and digital. Um, like everything in the Russian system, it sets up competing powers who are meant to compete with each other. That's the way the system works. So it's quite flexible, but, but it's centrally coordinated. And it is um, taken, taken very seriously. Um, so, I mean, that's, that's maybe the first thing to say about it. Uh, the Chinese as well. Um, these sort of regimes take propaganda very, very seriously. And, and it's central to their idea of how to control their own societies and how to manipulate others. So, firstly. Secondly, there's no shame around the word propaganda. Propaganda is seen as part of what you do, part of what the powerful should do, uh, an essential part of governance. And if anything, there is a scathing attitude towards the idea of media. There is no I concept of what in democracies is thought of as the public sphere, a place where people are meant to debate with each other and, and exchange opinions, where media are play a key role in this sort of rough and tumble of democracy. Um, there's no belief in this. Um, it's either accused of being inefficient, but usually it's just accused of being corrupt. So the BBC is actually government or media are all just tools of various secret um, cabals of, of powerful elites. Um, and so the idea of media existing as an independent force is dismissed. This is just, you know, the mask of democracy, which is actually controlled by vested interests. And, and the argument, if you want to call it an argument, is that at least dictatorships are honest and um, they don't play at this ridiculous idea of a public sphere. Or if they say the public sphere does exist, they say it's terribly inefficient. They say, look at this chaos of democracies. It's complete chaos. This is not the way to run a country in the 21st century. You need centralized control. You need propaganda. Or else you have America, which is in chaos. Or Ukraine. They often say, look at Ukraine, it's chaos. Yeah, that's, that's what the Russians and the Chinese think. I don't know if that's the answer you're looking for. But. No, this is, this is very interesting. And um, on the role of technology there, because lots of people saying like, oh, we're living in the age of so much information. Uh, but then in your book, you're actually discussing how it's, it's actually more um, dangerous in, in a way more, um, it's a better environment almost for propaganda to exist. Like you mentioned the troll farm in the suburbs of St. Petersburg that was founded by Prigozhin and he actually admitted to it recently. How does, I guess, like what's the responsibility of technological giants um, and actors in that? And how do we counteract troll farms in, in their existence? So, okay, if we're talking specifically about troll farms, uh, we usually associate troll farms with what the tech companies now call coordinated inauthentic behavior. So it's not about the existence of one lie or two lies. It's the mass creation of deceptive online accounts. And officially, the, most of the platforms have said they now have a policy of of battling that and stopping that activity. The question is enforcement. So I think we're much, I think the debate has been won around troll farms. The question is enforcement. What is the punishment for it? So let's say you're a troll farm, you've been caught, your accounts get shut down. Who cares? You order, you open up a thousand more. Yeah. The tech companies say they're regulating this field, but they police themselves. We have no access to how they do this. So I think the, we've had the debate about this for the last seven years. And it was a long journey because at first there was this very reactive and naive uh, response. To, Let's capture every bit of disinformation. Firstly, disinformation is not a legal term. So what does that mean, capture disinformation? And B, it's pointless on the internet trying to grab every little lie. So, so there was a journey of understanding for the expert community, the policy community. Um, I was involved in the parliamentary committee on disinformation, fake news in Britain from thinking about individual lies and pretty much getting rid of the term disinformation because there was no way you can really use it legally. Why? To, 
because it just doesn't exist as a legal term. I mean, two, thinking about coordinated deceptive behavior. Now, the problem is not one person saying a lie. The problem is thousands or hundreds of thousands of fake accounts saying it. So you go after the system, not after every piece of information or disinformation. And that, that was a correct process because it understood the essence of what was new about the internet. Um, there are existing laws about speech. You know, changing those laws is going to be very, very hard. What is new about the internet is not speech. What is new about the internet is the way you distribute the speech. So if you want to bring in new laws, you go after that. So, so, so there's been a journey to do that and, and there's been laws passed about that. And, and the question is enforcement and who's responsible and, and punishment. I mean, so let's say you're a PR company. I mean, let's forget about Prigozhin. You're a PR company in Britain and you do these fake campaigns. I mean, all that will happen is that you, the accounts get shut down. So until there's some real punishment for it, people will keep on doing it. What kind of punishment do you think there should be for it? I'm not a lawyer. I'm not a judge. Some, something that stops them doing it again. Fine. A fine at least would be nice. Mm -hmm. Some sort of, you know, something. Something. Yeah. Um, and on contrary to troll farms, um, cool. there are lots of real people who, I mean, they're not part of this uh, organized activity who believe very like straight up insane information when it comes to Ukraine. And obviously, there are a lot of things about the climate. Uh, when it comes to Ukraine, it's like Ukraine bombing Donbass for eight years and bio, US biolabs and all of those like almost nonsense. And um, it's really hard to engage with them. But should we even? Is there a point of engaging with these kind of people that are so, um, I guess, like live in their own informational world? Um, is there a way to persuade them, in your opinion? Okay, uh, so, so Julie, you, you, you lose a, a lot of really interesting language here. So these people. So are we sure that these people are one homogenous mass? Mm -hmm. uh, one, is slightly, one slightly risks doing the propagandist work for them when you say they are one people. One people. Mm -hmm. So the first thing you do is t t try to analyze them. So for example, on COVID, we did a lot of work in DNR a lot of focus groups inside DNR, mm -hmm. and also in Russian-speaking groups in Estonia, just trying to look at the COVID question. And why weren't, how did people feel about vaccines and, and so on and so forth. And it was very interesting. I mean, we also did a lot of research that we did, well, my university did in Baltimore. And people who are vaccine skeptics, part of them believe in crazy conspiracy theories. So that often it's a case of, okay, you know, Klinika. You know, it's, this, this could be people with just deep, deep, deep emotional issues. A lot weren't. A lot had had terrible experiences with the medical profession in the US. In Ukraine, uh, in the occupied territories and in Estonia, they didn't trust sort of like the medical profession because they'd had horrible experience with this medical profession in Soviet times. A lot of them had memories of Chernobyl. They'd been completely traumatized by Chernobyl. And the idea that you put anything in your body is it's fake. So what I'm saying is, you know, never call them these people. The moment you've done that, you've lost. That means you've already given the audience to the other side. Your job is to start analyzing the audience and understanding, okay, this is the hardcore who, you know, you probably don't even want to re start to engage. The second thing you said is persuade. Persuade to what end? What is our aim here? It's our aim to, what, to get them to use other sources of media? Is our aim to stop them from voting for fascist parties? Is our aim to make them not fight? So again, what's the aim? What I would definitely get rid of is a, a desire to search for some sort of morality tale. Are they good or bad? That's largely irrelevant, especially in the context of war. Um, that's something for education to think about, what is a good citizen and stuff like that. If we're talking about a war, whether a hot war like here, or kind of a cold war, because, you know, where, even though it doesn't want to admit it, the collective West is now in a cold war with Russia, while, they're simil while having a hot war at the same time, um, you really have to move away from, from caring whether these people are good or bad. Um, that's a real fake search that's completely irrelevant. What we have to do is win. And so winning will be who understands these audiences better. And winning is understanding what you want them to do. So those are the questions we need to be asking.
How do you assess Ukraine's um, work on the informational front if you if you analyze that in the past? I think I think you, you, Ukraine has completely rewritten the rule book, um, and I think is now a model for for other democracies. They've proved. And whatever one feels about the current government, what they've completely proved is that a democracy can do international, let's call them public information campaigns, because you don't want to use the word propaganda, international public information campaigns that are effective. So basically what's happened in the last 30 years in the West is that we've completely lost our self-belief around doing, sometimes called public diplomacy, you know, the idea that Western leaders can talk to the populations across the world. We used to do this in the Cold War quite well, did it in the Second World War really well, just think of Churchill's speeches. The last 30 years, we've completely lost the gift of it, and we had a terrible experience. What terrible experience? We created a, a disaster, a tragedy, and, and a horror around the war on terror, which was the last time we tried to do it. So there is now an allergy of doing this sort of public information. And Zelensky and his team have shown that a leader of a democracy can talk to nations across the world, reach them, and engage them to such a level that Zelensky is now probably the second most popular politician, or if not the most popular pol politician in most countries, in, 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 in democracies. They've completely rewritten the rule book. And, you know, I live in Washington, and, and whenever I ask the sort of, people in power. Washington's like, why don't we do more, you know, public information campaigns to counter the Russians? And they're like, oh, we can't do that. Dictatorships do that. We don't do that. I'm like, well, historically we have actually. And the fact is that the, the, we've lost the gift and, and we have got, um, you know, and, and what we've done, we've done terribly the last 30 years. So I think he's completely, and it's a Zelensky thing, frankly, he's completely rewritten the rule book. And it's a sort of, it's a new, it's a new positive example of how you can do democratic communication in the 21st century. So it's been amazing. So that's been very, very strong. Um, it'll get, it gets harder with every year because as the war continues, it's hard to keep that going. Then it's important not just to rely on Zelensky um, because people need more characters than that. Um, and also there are many more stories that need to be told. Um, I guess you guys are doing that. Um, and then there's the question of audiences beyond democracies, where Ukraine finds it harder to make inroads because countries don't care. Countries historically were allied with the Soviet Union, countries in Africa and Latin America, or countries want to be like Russia. They like what Russia is doing. They want to go and invade their neighbors as well. And they see Putin as a great example. Yeah, that was actually my um, next uh, question, specifically about Ukraine's, I guess, communications impact in the global south and other uh, countries that are not really democracies. Um, do you see any hope of any kind of message um, reaching them in a positive way for Ukraine? So there's a lot of talk in European capitals and in Kyiv as well and in DC now of something called, and I think I'm responsible for this, an information Ramstein, which, which is an idea I floated after doing a bunch of research at the start of the war, but really thinking about how can the allies work together for exactly this sort of question. What do you do with the harder communications challenges? And I think it really is about allies coming together and thinking how we can help each other. So there are places where Ukraine speaks directly really well. There are some places where Ukraine can start a new communication, Taiwan, Japan, you know, countries that see a parallel between China and Russia and are seeing a parallel in their experience. And there are other countries which just do not give. And, um, yeah. And you can start, you can start telling them about how Ukraine has amazing you know, digital technology, and that's really important, but that's long term, yeah? So that's when you start talking to your allies. That's going, okay, we can't really make an inroad here. How can you help us? There could be Ukraine's allies who have leverage in those countries. There could be Ukraine's allies like Ireland who have great relationships with Latin American countries. So how can allies all start using 
their information leverage, which is often connected to financial leverage as well. Let's be let's be honest. It's never just information. It's often about trade, often about investment. How do we start using that in a coordinated way to be more than the sum of our parts? Um, sometimes America will be a great partner. Sometimes America will be the worst partner. So working that out and then prioritizing. I mean, you just called it the global south. Again, it's not your fault. That term is used. It's a term. Yeah. It is, but it's, it's a terrible term. I mean, we're talking about what three quarters of the world we're saying is one thing. Latin America is completely different dynamics. Every country around Venezuela loathes Russia because they've supported Venezuela and have created this flood of violence, crime, and refugees spreading to their countries. They detest Russia. So there are very, very anti-Russian countries in Latin America. And there are countries like Brazil who are Russia's de facto allies. So again, never call it one thing. Again, break it down. Think about where the ins are, but also think about what matters. Because maybe a lot of this is wasted energy. And this talk is incredibly interesting. And I wish we had more time to talk specifically about propaganda and disinformation and how we can be better in using the tools that you're uh, describing for, for Ukraine's benefit specifically. But I also want to talk about the Reckoning Project and what you're doing right now. Could you describe a little bit more about that? No, but the Reckoning Project is all about that. So, so oh. I mean, generally, since 2015, both in my academic work and in my sort of media work, I sort of decided very early that I didn't want to do back foot stuff. I don't want to analyze what the other side is doing. I want to think much more about what we do. And virtually all the research that I do at university is about how do you create pro-democratic media that can compete with authoritarian propaganda. So I'm actually not that obsessed with looking at the other side too much, mm -hmm. uh, simply because other people do that really well. But also because my background is, is much more in the creative side of things. I sort of I went to film school, I made documentaries, I write books. I, I, I like to create things. I don't, analysis is part of that, but only as an, a preface to creation. So the reckoning is, is one of the strategic responses uh, to disinformation and more importantly, impunity. Um, you know, when Putin tells the whole world that, I don't know, there are no Russian soldiers in Crimea, back to 2014, or now makes ridiculous claims around Butcher. It's not disinformation. He's not trying to trick anyone. He's trying to say, I don't care. I'm going to lie. I'm going to murder. And there's nothing you can do about it. They're not hiding their war crimes very hard. You know? So how do we end the impunity? You know? We live in this weird world where we have so much information, so much access to evidence, and very little enforcement or punishment or justice that comes at the end of it. So the idea of the reckoning is how do we bridge the gap from truth to justice? So very simply, we put two groups of people together who usually hate each other and get them to cooperate, journalists and lawyers. Why do they usually hate each other? Because lawyers work for their clients who are often, I mean, that's all they do. They have a client and they serve that client. And their clients are often the people that journalists are trying to, are trying to bring, shed some light over. Um, because lawyers, because I mean, it's a profession that's, that's, that's dedicated to, to serving your clients. But I think in this case, in the case of war crimes, it's not. So I think when it comes to war crimes, we're actually allies. Here, we're allies in the search for truth and, and justice. So I think in this case, we can put our usual differences aside and work together towards this greater cause, um, as, and, as many other people are as well. We have journalists, we have around 12, 20, various different times, Ukrainian journalists, Ukrainian team, doing this really, really, really deep analysis of different war crimes in Ukraine. So we don't just go there and leave like most journalists do. We will stay on one crime scene six months a year Oh. as long as we need to be. And we're not just doing journalistic interviews, we're gathering evidence which is in line with international human rights law. So the journalists have been trained by lawyers and others to make sure when they do interviews, they don't re-traumatize people, they do no harm. They gather evidence in such a way that it can be used for trial later, which is much more rigorous than when journalists do it. 
So they gather their evidence. They didn't create amazing stories out of this. We were at the front cover of Time. We do a lot of work at the Atlantic, Vanity Fair, also in the Philippines and in, in, in getting some stuff ready for South Africa. So doing that, but then we've got this incredible archive, which our legal team is going through, looking for patterns and then thinking which prosecutions around the world, The Hague, Europe, Ukrainian prosecutor, do we work with in order to start to build cases? So what are we trying to, I mean, it is very much, for me anyway, um, a way to push back against the Putins of this world. They're trying to say that facts don't matter, that truth doesn't matter, and there is no justice. We're trying to shorten the distance between truth and justice. So I see it completely as a strategic response to, to disinformation and, and impunity. Um, and it's the sort of creative responses we need. Um, I mean, it's fantastic to do debunking, fact-checking. They're really important, but they're very passive. What we have to do is start you know, attacking the, you know, the basis uh, on which authoritarian propaganda builds its power. Um, and part of that directly then is looking into the question of the legal culpability of Russian propagandists. Can we bring them to trial? Can we increase sanctions on them? Now, that's one of the things that we're beginning to look at. It's very challenging because usually propagandists get away with it. Historically, at Nuremberg, for example, the main, uh, the head of the Reich's radio, so, so Hitler's Kisilov or Hitler's Simonian, uh, got away with it. He was found not guilty. You couldn't prove the, his connection. His name was Hans Fritscher. You couldn't prove his connection to the crimes. He was just a talking head. That was his argument. I just say stuff. I don't know. I don't know what happened afterwards. I'm not in the military. I'm not in the concentration camp guard. I don't know why I just say stuff. And words, well, who knows? And classically, propagandists are protected by freedom of speech. America has been very reluctant to sanction the propagandists, the Russian propagandists. Sort of changing slowly, but very slowly. And classically, you know, not only is disinformation not, not, not a crime in any kind of serious country, um, but even um, things like hate speech, you know, the law around them is very, very vague. Some of the language that Russia is using and Russian propaganda is using does sound a lot like incitement to genocide. And I know there's people working on that side, which is amazing. And, and certainly if a genocide case can be brought against Russia and incitement to genocide as part of that, that'll be incredibly important. But that can risk missing a lot of the everyday, everyday, the everyday atrocities that Russia does. So what I'm very focused on is thinking about the connection of propaganda to specific war crimes, to crimes against humanity. So if we get genocide, amazing, but that's a really, really high bar. I want to sort of change the everyday integration of propaganda into things like the attack on the maternity hospital in Mariupol or the bombing of Kramatorsk. What was the aim of the propagandists in those operations, which are clearly war crimes? And if we can show that they are integrated, that they had a sense of what was going on, then I think we might be able to break any ground. And do you see so far ways in which those two are connected? Well, we can see them firstly. So what we will start with, we're just starting this. Legal research moves slowly. Uh, but but um, we're trying to make it faster, but it's slowly. So what you would look at is things like, and this is where the, your troll farm thing is very interesting. And this is why the digital thing is very interesting. What you would look at, you know, were there a thousand Telegram accounts and 20 YouTube channels in the preface to the attack saying the same things more and more frequently, which is quite easily traceable through digital technology. So you couldn't really do that in the Second World War. You, know, you can really, it's much harder to do that in that time. So if you could show that and show, okay, look, in the days before the attack, you know, mentions of Azov battalions in Mariupol Hospital go up XXX percent, you're like, okay, this is interesting. This is already showing some sort of coordinated behavior. So who's responsible for that behavior? What are the connections between the troll farms and the presidential administration? Are there any emails that have come to light which show that? So You'd have to show what's happening in the propaganda, how it relates to what's happening on the ground. And then you'd have to establish how the system works. So those are the questions you would look at. And um, 
I do think that we already saw Russia using propaganda in a very integrated way with its various war crimes in Syria. So there's people who have already looked at this in Syria and have already seen those patterns. And, you know, there is plenty of research to get into regarding they're doing it today. So those are the things I want to look at. Yeah, we're just starting. Yeah, I assume it's a very long um, process, unfortunately. Obviously, we all would like to see it faster, but how do you see the the general, I guess, road of justice for Ukraine and bringing these people to justice? What are maybe the things or a key step that needs to happen? Because yeah. for a lot of Ukrainians give an argument, well, like they're, we need to first win and sort of win on the battlefield. And then it will bring the justice after that. And some people argue, well, it's not that, you know, um, that's simultaneous. That's so classically, that's what's happened. You have the war, then you have 30 years while we look for the war criminals, then you have justice. Yeah. I mean, no, I think there's a demand to get it quicker. That's my sense. I haven't done any polling on it in Ukraine, but I think people want it sooner. And I think what's revolutionary about Ukraine is that this stuff is happening as the war is going on, which I think is, I think that's a good thing. But look, I'm not a lawyer. Um, and when I think about justice, and I think maybe we all should do that, we should think about justice in all its forms. So obviously a tribunal, The Hague, universal jurisdiction, all these legal ideas of justice are great and we'll let the lawyers do that. But, you know, I'm sure you've interviewed lawyers and talked to lawyers. We're talking about three, five, ten year sort of cycles. I like to think about justice in all its forms. There's justice in the court of public opinion. There's justice in the court of sanctions. I think there's a lot you can do there. There's economic justice. You know, who should be paying for the reconstruction of Ukraine? All of these are forms of justice. And I think we have to be thinking about all of those fora for justice. And I think we have to be talking about that all the time and, and making sure that people understand that these are all forms of justice. I think we also have to understand that it will always be unsatisfying. Um, now we sort of look back at Nuremberg, the trial of Nazi leadership, as somehow satisfying. It wasn't at the time at all. Twelve Nazis were found, were executed afterwards. There was a complete sense of dissatisfaction. And the trials that came afterwards, I think, out of, I can't remember, out of hundreds of thousands of Nazis put on trial domestically in Germany, only thousands were found guilty. There was a complete sense of injustice. And, you know, that was somehow compensated by Israelis through sort of Mossad assassination gangs going around capturing and killing Nazis. But it's never really, there is no satisfaction. I think we can do a lot more than has been done in the past if we do all those things and then tell those stories. But we also have to be realistic. There's, there's no real justice for, for the sort of things that Russia is doing. It'll always, I mean, it'll never quite be satisfying. And when it comes to the question of uh, public or collective responsibility, when it comes to uh, the German case, but also Russia today. Um, I think a lot of Ukrainians are um, dissatisfied with how the West usually ignores the collective responsibility uh, and just calls it like Putin's war and, you know, his gang and stuff. But uh, for us, we see a lot of Russians are essentially being like, complicit with it, whether they're being like completely, you know, silent or um, just overall not doing any action to make it stop. What's your personal views on that? And like, I know that there is a lot of like this sense of responsibility versus guilt and whether making somebody yeah. feel guilty is even like productive thing. Um, is it something that is... So this, que this question of collective... Res I mean, firstly, this is clearly not... This is... Russia has been... I mean, talking about the historical context and the cultural context, Russia has been attacking Ukraine for hundreds of years. This is just the latest iteration. Um, this is embedded. Russia's sense of ownership of Ukraine is embedded in Russian literature, Russian education. So the idea that Putin just came up with this is absurd. I mean, just historically, this is clearly part of Russian culture and Russian history. And this is just what they do. This is not the first time they're trying a genocide here. So, so I mean, obviously, it's not just Putin. I mean, that's just, I mean, that's really just ignoring history. So, um, and that's embedded in Russian culture and Russian education. And so anybody, if you're talking about 
what it is. This is this is part of the story. Talking about people now, I mean, this question of collective responsibility. God, I mean, there's the legal bit of it, which I don't really understand, and I think lawyers will will struggle with that. I'd love to see sectoral sanctions, for example. I'd love to see anybody who works on Russian propaganda, anybody connected to the war machine, should I think face sanctions. The West balks at that. I can never tell whether they they don't want to do that because of the, what is collective responsibility or whether it's just technically a bit of a headache. Like, where do you get the lists? How yeah. do you know who worked there? So I can never tell which excuse they're using. But I mean, I think without a doubt that should be happening. And no, I don't think there should be normal travel visas during a time of war. They just wouldn't be in a time of war. Imagine Britain was at war with another country, of course you would change the visa policy. So the whole visa policy debate I find absurd. You, you create new visa policies befitting what's going on. And uh, yeah, you do better refugee visas. I mean, whatever, you, you work on this. Of course you change the visa policy when a war has started, or this sort of war. So, so I, I find that, if you're talking about the visa issue, I find the excuses there absurd from the West. But the deeper question of responsibility, I don't know. Let's go back to the German example. So what are we, 70 years after the war? And we're still debating, were Germans responsible for the Holocaust? I mean, every year there's a book from either side. Yeah. Um, in 1946, Karl Jaspers and Hannah Arendt start fighting about this. So this is a very deep philosophical question where, I, where you're quite right. It usually is the border between responsibility and guilt. Yes, they're responsible. Does that make them guilty? And it becomes a philosophical discussion. And for me, it becomes completely empty. Mm-hmm. What I can say is this. I'm going to flip it on its head and connected to propaganda, because this is something I do understand. Those Russians that I speak to who do feel a sense of responsibility, and they do exist, not as a social movement they don't exist, but I certainly speak to Russians who talk about that completely and their sense of responsibility, and some of them individually do do something. They're the ones who are most resistant to Putin's propaganda. So Putin's propaganda is to say, you have no responsibility. Democratic agency doesn't exist. Yeah? Nasa Stavilya is the main, most successful propaganda line. Yeah. yeah. His whole propaganda system is built around the idea that the individual doesn't matter and that you can't change anything. Yeah? You live in a world of such vast conspiracies, of so much confusion, you need an authoritarian leader to lead you. And people are delighted to get rid of responsibility and freedom and agency because it's really hard to have them. So for me, it's become like a a sort of a line, okay? If you don't take responsibility, that means however much of an oppositionist you are, you're actually still living within Putin's propaganda model. And sadly, I hear this from a lot of, from a lot of people who've left Russia who are very against Putin. They're like, I don't take responsibility. So my, my response is that means you're still living in his propaganda. And I don't personally feel I actually am in a position to judge. I'm just looking at it from the way language works and what it tells me about the success of the propaganda. Um, I think Ukrainians can judge, as in Ukrainians who are citizens of Ukraine and who are, who are fighting can judge. I think Russians can judge each other. At the end of the day, I'm, a, I'm, a, I'm just a Londoner. <laughs> um, so I don't want to be doing the one doing the judging. I think Ukrainians definitely have the right to judge. But when we talk about the success of the propaganda, it's, and we talk about myths, and we talk about sociological propaganda. This is what Alul is talking about, yeah? Alul is saying, doesn't matter, the disinformation campaigns, you know, that is nonsense. I mean, that's easy to analyze. But if you've bought into this idea that it's not my responsibility, you're actually living inside Putin's propaganda myth that you have no agency. You're still there. You think you've left, you haven't. You're still there. And... You know, and I see this in the sociological research, as in like the, there's still a lot of sort of focus groups and interviews being done in Russia. It's very interesting reading them because people will be saying, I don't like the war and stuff like that. I don't support it. I don't support skeptical or even say that Putin, you know, it's a mistake or they still repeat the myths. All these deeper psychological myths repeat over and over, and especially the main myth of Putin propaganda. You know, he's saving us from chaos. If not Putin, then chaos. I mean, insane. I mean, like, and this is from, no, but this is from young people who fled the country, who are scared of being mobilized, who like completely are not invested in the war from a really self interested point of view. 
Forget about the ideology, though. Personally, they don't want to go and fight. And they'll still say this. And they don't remember the 90s. And so the idea to which, despite on the conscious level being opposed, for very self-interested reason being opposed to the war, not because they like Ukraine or anything, but just because they don't, you know, they don't want to die, they will still repeat the propaganda myths. So that's what Ilul was talking about. He's talking the extent to which real propaganda, the really powerful one, goes really deep and sits inside these mythical structures. And, you know, I'm, and what I'm fascinated by is why those ideas work. Why is something like Atnas Pateyud Sat Kusit Kusok, which for your English things, uh, that's a classic of Russian propaganda. They, we don't know who they are, are trying to bite a piece from us. Or without Putin chaos, why is that so resonant? Why does that work so powerfully? Why do people inhabit this, even when they consciously might disagree with the wall? And also why responsibility and this question of responsibility is so important. So anyway, those are things that we're going to have to tackle if you really want to start undermining the, the Russian psychological system, I suppose. That's incredibly interesting, especially I found like what you said about uh, Russians who escaped or who are living abroad and who oppose the war or call them themselves like oppositionists, but say like I don't take responsibility. Um, and you're you're claiming that actually no, like if you say that you live in the Putin's yeah. Putin's you know, war. It's only the ones who say I do take responsibility who who might, but but they don't exist as a social group. Yeah, like it's they're individuals. It's they're, they haven't been able to. The ones who say I take responsibility haven't been able to come together in a movement. Which, okay, inside Russia you could say danger, but the fact that they haven't done that outside of Russia is, shows just how deep the propaganda goes. The fact that even outside of Russia they think they have no agency, they can't change anything, that whole set of attitudes is exactly one of the main messages of Putin propaganda. Mm -hmm. and, and that has been, I think even to me, who saw, I mean, I wrote a really book about it, uh, but, but to see that play out now and the lack of, the lack of a strong anti-Putin movement outside of Russia, for the millions who've left, has just been, I mean, it's horrible when you see your own work confirmed. <laughs> it's just, it's just, I just like, weird. Could I say like the Germans who left Nazi Germany did more? <laughs> than the Russians who left Putin's Russia. And what's your thoughts on uh, the, the leaders of the opposition, the Navalny team? And but there, there, there is no opposition, it's a political movement. Again, it's a, you know, um, the Navalny's in, in jail. Because it also seems like a, like a tool for propaganda to like show that there is, you know, to give an Oscar, to show the, how like a hero he is he's, for he's, the world. He's in jail, I don't know, it's in jail. Um, it's just a question of, you know, effectiveness. They had great hopes that they could change Russia, and there's a, you know, I don't know, that's sort of a separate story we'd have to analyze to what extent they ever had a real strategy, to what extent they were, you see, I don't know, it's sort of a, there's a long story of the, the journey of Russian opposition as, is, you know, something we'd have to go right, go back to sort of to the 1990s to start analyzing. Yeah. Well, uh, we're going to be wrapping up soon, but before that, I wanted to ask you, since you visit Ukraine very often right now, what's your favorite places in Ukraine that you would recommend other people, your colleagues maybe, to visit future? Ukraine's at war, but um, um, well, so... Either uh, during or after, I mean, a lot of people think that Ukraine is like entire front line and there's a debate whether should, yeah. you, should you come or not and why you should come or not. I mean... You come for whatever you want, yeah, but but just you know, and and you can you can go to all sorts of places, and you can go to my family's literary festival in Chernivtsi if you Beautiful. if you're into into poetry festivals. Um, but um, um, just you know, whatever you do, wherever you come from, just just bring a couple of drones. Be useful. That's great. That's great. That's great. Um, yeah, thank you so much for doing this uh, great interview. For me, it personally was very, very um, useful and I think eye-opening on a lot of things in this topic. Um, thank you so much for everybody who has been watching this. If you enjoyed this video and our series, please subscribe to the channel of Ukrainer in English and continue supporting Ukraine. And uh, yeah, thank you so much.